Hello, my name is Douglas Baldwin and I wrote this cookbook, Sous Vide for the Home Cook. And today I'm going to be talking to you about food safety. Food safety is very important and something that most people don't think enough about. A lot of people though worry about food safety when it comes to sous vide cooking, but not when they cook traditionally. In many ways, sous vide cooking is safer than traditional cooking because we have much greater control of temperature and the way in which we cook the food. Today I'll be talking about food safety while I cook this large batch of chicken breasts. A lot of people think of poultry as being particularly dangerous. That's because there are many microorganisms not only on the surface, like on steaks, but inside as well. Microorganisms can be divided into three main categories. Pathogens, which are the microorganisms that can make us sick, and then spoilage and beneficial microorganisms such as the bacteria that sets yogurt and that we often eat to help with digestion. Most of the bacteria, in fact, are spoilage and beneficial bacteria. It's only a very small number of them that are pathogens that can make us sick. There are three pathogens that are especially important in sous vide cooking. Those are salmonella, listeria, and E. coli. Uh, listeria is the hardest of the different pathogens that we work with when cooking to kill and destroy but it takes fewer salmonella and E. coli to make us sick. So in, throughout my cookbook and in my web guide, I have recipes that reduce listeria by a factor of a million to one. Food safety starts at the store. When you buy food, make sure that it's within its expiration date and doesn't have a strong odor, especially for poultry, pork, and beef. If it has a strong order, odor, then that probably means a lot of spoilage microorganisms have grown. And while, as I said, spoilage microorganisms aren't bad in themselves, they may indicate that there is a large amount of growth of pathogenic microorganisms. So that's why we say not to buy food that has a strong smell or looks like it's spoiled. Uh, that's something important to realize, that food pathogens can't be seen, smelt, or tasted. It's only spoilage and beneficial bacteria that can impart a flavor or a smell. When you're at the store and you're picking up something like meat or eggs or milk, make sure to get them last in the fri at the store so that they remain refrigerated as long as possible. And as soon as you get them home, put them in your fridge or cook them immediately. These I just took out of the refrigerator and I'm going to bag them up and begin cooking them sous vide. It's important before you start cooking sous vide that you carefully wash your hands. First, rinse your hands, then lather up your fingernails and clean under them with a fingernail brush, then rinse your hands, apply soap, build up a good lather for a good 10 to 20 seconds, and then rinse your hands and dry them with paper towels. This will remove or at least reduce the bacteria on your hands and other microorganisms by a factor of a million to one. You don't actually need to use micro uh, or antimicrobial soap. Plain old soap actually works better because you have some microorganisms on your hand that will kill pathogens and other bad bacteria and viruses, and it's good to keep them there. And so if you use uh, regular soap, that'll keep your hands in a condition that will kill off bad things quicker. So I'm going to start vacuum sealing these, and I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. I finished vacuum sealing the chicken breasts. Uh, you can see almost any of my other videos for details on how to vacuum seal raw food. Uh, now, the reason we vacuum seal the food is to allow for the efficient transfer of heat from the water bath to the food. A lot of people think it's because we're trying to stop aerobic bacteria from growing in the bag. But this really doesn't make a lot of sense because one fairly recent study on vacuum sealing found that the majority of the packages of food had near atmospheric levels of oxygen in the bag, which means there's plenty of oxygen for aerobic bacteria to grow in the bag. Uh, one of the benefits of vacuum sealing the food so that we can keep the water and the food separate is that after we get done cooking it, it will prevent recontamination of the food. We don't have to think about recontamination, but one of the reasons we only keep leftovers for a couple days in the refrigerator is that uh, you can get bacteria such as listeria and salmonella from other things and it can get in the food and then they can begin to grow in the food and make us sick. But by keeping 
uh, the food sealed in these vacuum bags, then there's no way for these pathogens to get into the already cooked food. This is one of the reasons that we uh, vacuum seal them. As I said, the other one is to make sure we get a good transfer of heat. Uh, one thing that's important to do is make sure you always vacuum seal food in a single layer. If you double the thickness of the food, as I discuss in my, my guide, you will not double, but you'll quadruple the cooking time required to pasteurize. Uh, different foods take different amount of times to pasteurize. For instance, chicken at the same temperature as beef will take longer to pasteurize, and temperature is extremely important. Cooking uh, at 130 degrees, say for beef, versus 140 degrees will make a uh, four-fold difference in the amount of time that you need to kill off the pathogens. So temperature is very important, which is why we use carefully controlled water baths like uh, either the immersion circulator or the sous vide supreme bath, which can hold the water plus or minus one degree, and that's good enough for our purposes. So once I place the chicken in the water bath, it's important to make sure that they're not touching. Because if the food is touching, then uh, it'll be the same as if you've double packed them in the pack and it'll take much longer to cook. So it's important that you have a little bit of water all around the food. Uh, this rack that I'm using is actually from the sous vide supreme, uh, which is one of the things I think is best about it. Again, make sure that the food is well separated in the water bath. Now you can look up in my book or on my guide online and you'll see that chicken breasts take about two hours to pasteurize at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'll see you back in about two hours. Welcome back. It's been a little over two hours since I put the chicken breasts in the water bath. It's okay to hold them a little longer, it won't hurt the food safety of it. If you hold them for much, much longer, it will make them too tender and not quite as palatable. One thing that I forgot to mention that it's always important to make sure all your pouches are completely submerged in the water. If they start for, to float for some reason, say you didn't get enough air out of the bags when you were vacuum sealing, you might want to put a wire rack over the pouches to make sure they're completely submerged. Now I usually cook chicken breasts at 140 degrees but I could cook them at a lower temperature. You might worry about the so-called danger zone of 40 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit, but this isn't quite true. Most food pathogens, such as salmonella, stop growing at around 122 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of them, in particular Clostridium perfringens, can grow up to 126.1 degrees Fahrenheit, and so I usually recommend cooking at 130 degrees or higher. How long it takes to cook and pasteurize the food at 130 degrees depends on what you're cooking. Chicken will take a little longer than beef. And as I mentioned before, say for beef, pasteurizing 130 degrees takes almost four times longer than pasteurizing 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if you're just going to serve the chicken directly out of the water bath, you don't have to worry about spores or botulism that some people complain and worry about with sous vide cooking. This is because two genus of bacteria that can be dangerous to humans, Bacillus and Clostridium, can form spores. Spores are sort of dormant pathogens that aren't dangerous in themselves but can outgrow into live bacteria that can be harmful. So the best way to prevent these spores from outgrowing and becoming dangerous is to rapidly chill them in an ice water bath such as this. Here I've placed uh, um, about a bag of ice and filled about an equal amount of water and I'm going to take the chicken breasts and place them in the ice water bath. This will make sure that they chill very quickly. It'll take about 30 minutes for them to go from 140 degrees Fahrenheit down to about 40 degrees Fahrenheit where any spores that uh, outgrew into live bacteria would take a very long time to grow. If you're just going to place them in the refrigerator, I usually recommend only keeping them in the refrigerator for four to five days. In theory, if you have a very cold refrigerator that's about 38 degrees Fahrenheit, then you can keep them in your refrigerator for three to four weeks. But unless you have an accurate thermometer 
and you check to make sure that your fridge is always below that temperature, it's best to, co to keep them in the fridge for a much shorter amount of time, usually four or five days as I said. If after you put them in the water bath and take them out, you freeze them, you can store them in a freezer safely for up to a year. Uh, you can store them much longer in the freezer for safety purposes, but the taste degrades after about uh, 12 to 18 months. Welcome back again. So I've now had the cooked chicken breast in this ice water bath for a little over 30 minutes. When you take them out, it's a good idea to dry them off because in the excess water on the outside of the bag could allow some pathogens to grow on the bag. And then I like to mark the date on each bag so that I know when they were cooked so I know how long they've been in the refrigerator or in the freezer. It's uh, uh, chicken breast is very easy to tell that they're chicken breast, but when you uh, freeze a lamb or beef or pork, it's a good idea to write what cut of meat they are and from what animal they are, because once they're frozen in the freezer, it's sometimes very hard to tell what they are. Uh, for more details on food safety, please see my cookbook, Sous Vide for the Home Cook, or my web guide, A Practical Guide to Sous Vide Cooking. And you can find links to both those at www.douglasbaldwin.com.